It was 3 o'clock on a Thursday in August, which meant that it was 98 degrees outside in San Antonio, Texas. But on the HEV parking lot, it was 102. I uh, parked my little Subaru beneath a twig that was impersonating a tree <laughs> just to make myself feel better. Of course, that placed me two football fields away from the doors. And so as I began my walk up to those blessed, those blessed uh, glass doors, it would open and a tsunami of air conditioning would hit me. I was grumping with every step. But as I drew near to those doors, I spied a young man in a bright red H-E-B polo and a matching hat. And I could tell that he had some type of cognitive disability. But that didn't slow him down a bit. He was racing around pulling out carts for every lady that walked in through the double doors. He would go out into the crosswalk and safely escort seniors uh, across the way. And every mama that came out the doors with little ones on her arm or in her arms, he would take her groceries and go to the car and place them in her minivan. But more than that, every single person who came close to him, he would raise up his arms and say, Isn't this a great day? After he said that about the 10th time, I had to look up into the sky at that infernal, unrelenting sun just to make sure that he and I were walking on the same earth. <laughs> so I walked, and honestly, I was trying to avoid him. I walked in through the doors. He was over by the oranges. He looked at me, and he goes, Hey! Hey! Are you, my, are you Maggie's friend? And I said, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, no. Then I thought about it and said, but I wish I was. <laughs> and he says, I've got to shake your hand. And he came running over. He took my hand in his hand. And there was so much warmth in his grip. I said to myself, I'm going to start buying groceries twice a day. Well, he went on about his business, and on Thursdays, you need to know that I go shop for my staples. Now, this is important for some of you men to hear, because I'm very health conscious. First of all, I go about, oh, eight rows over, and I buy a can of H-E-B chili and beans. <laughs> now, I have tried them all, and I'm here to prophesy that they make the best. So I get myself a can of H-E-B chili and beans. Then I go over about three aisles to the cookies and crackers, and I buy a whole box of Nabisco premium saltines. they got to be those. And then the piece de la resistance. That's French, by the way. <laughs> I, go, I go two aisles over, and I buy a bag of H-E-B jelly beans. Now, if Reagan had eaten those instead of jelly bellies, he'd still be alive. <clears throat> so I got that. By the way, I want you to notice that every food group is represented in those. <laughs> and also, I, I need you to hear this since I'm only about two minutes from being 64. If Kay dies before I do, that is going to be my diet. So just get ready, you know. Pray for her health. <clears throat> so I, um, I cradled my treasure against me, and I walked back out into the, into the blazing sun, feeling a little better knowing that I had my treasure. And as I began to move towards my car, I noticed my, uh, my red-shirted uh, friend uh, off to the side. He was helping a lady on a walker pack up her groceries in her Camry. And he helped her get all her groceries in there. And then, and then he took her to, her to the driver's side door. And he opened it for her and he made sure she was situated. And then before he left her, he leaned over and he said, Ma'am, you've got the prettiest gray hair I've ever seen. <laughs> and 
And I swear, I thought the woman and the Toyota were going to levitate. <laughs> well, I was just trying to, you know, surreptitiously trying to get, get, go off the side. And he turns around and he spies me. He let go of the grocery cart and says, Hey, I know you. He says, I, I, I think you need a hug. And he ran over to me, and he wrapped his arms around me. And you want to know what? I did need a hug. And I got to my um, ancient, uh, my ancient Subaru, and I uh, got in it, and it was now more like in a man, a man, a kitchen range. <laughs> <laughs> but before I turned the key, I asked myself this question. I asked myself this question, just who is disabled here? Who's disabled? Maybe this 64-year-old grumpy man, but not, not the boy in the bright H-E-B polo and matching hat. Not him. Not the one who can perceive no distance between himself and another. Not the one who is willing to reach out and hug a stranger, even a bald, homely one. <laughs> He's not disabled. He's fully alive. And what, what an interesting contrast, a frightening contrast, actually, between the boy in the bright red H-E-B shirt and the disciples that Justin just read about. The disciples, <laughs> no, they're locked in an ego-fueled argument as to which one of them is the greatest. Because there can only be one, right? There can only be one. And Jesus hears about all this he wants to, and he finally decides not to berate them or to lecture them. But he says something rather simple. He says, look, if, if you really want to be the greatest, if you're really intent on being the greatest, well, you got to be the last. And if you really want to be the greatest, you have to be the servant to the other. And they're evidently looking at him as dull as, you know, uh, as, as a butter knife. And so he takes a child and he brings the child into the middle of them and interesting what Jesus does according to the Bible he embraces the child do you catch that he embraces the child and he says whoever receives one such child in my name actually is receiving me and by the way anyone who receives me actually welcomes the one, the Father, who sent me. Whoa, whoa. You see, Jesus is not most concerned about the disciples' selfishness or their uber ambition. He's most concerned about what disables them. And what disables the disciples is the same thing that disables you and me. And that is, we think we're isolated souls walking on the face of this earth, and we aren't. What disables the disciples and what disables you and me is we think there's all this distance between us. And the reason we think there's so much distance between us is because we don't have our connection right with the Lord. That's the reason. We're meant to live and perceive of ourselves in completely different ways. And so Jesus marches out, Jesus marches out the little, marches out the little boy in, uh, or girl and embraces her, him, in order to set the disciples straight. And he knows they're way off. I mean, did you hear what, did you hear what Jesus was trying to tell the disciples before they even get into this argument? He says, look, guys, I just want to let you know, in a very short order, I am going to be betrayed, I'm going to be arrested, and I'm going to be executed. And in three days, I'll rise again, but there's a lot of water under the bridge before we get there. 
I don't want you to tell anybody, but I just want you to, you need to know this. He might as well have told them, you know, guys, today I'm going to have lunch on the dark side of the moon. Would you bring the potato salad? Because they don't hear a word he says. Not one word. And so they fall into this argument about who's the greatest. And just... Just as the Lord marches that child into the middle of them, the Lord marched out the boy in the H-E-B red shirt in front of me to get a hold of us and let us know there's another way. You know, Jesus begins by telling the disciples repeatedly that he's not separate from the Father. Have you ever noticed that? If you read John, especially the Gospel of John, in the fifth chapter, he, he says to the disciples, look, <laughs> I only do what I see the Father doing. I only do what I see him doing. And then in the same chapter, he says, he says I, I, don't do this, I don't do this stuff under my own authority, but I work under the authority of the Father. And in the 14th chapter of John, it, I, which is the most powerful, I think, he says, look, he says, he says it is the Father dwelling in me, the Father who dwells in me, who speaks through me and acts through me. Jesus is telling the disciples in no uncertain terms, he's not a solo pro practitioner. He works in absolute, complete, intimate communion with the Father. Now, here's the big bongos. Here's the miracle. Here's the important part. We're invited into that same relationship. We're invited into that same communion. If you pay attention in, in the Gospel of John, just as Jesus is ending the Last Supper, and you know that just hours from the time that he ends the Last Supper, he is going to be arrested. At the end of the Last Supper, Jesus offers his longest and most profound and heart-rending prayer. And in that prayer, he says this. Listen carefully. He says, Father... Just as I am in you and you are in me, may, may they be in us. And if they are in us, the world will know that you have sent me. You know, so often we're so, we're so concerned about, you know, how can I be a witness or how can I do the right thing? But you know, the Bible's emphasis is on being the right thing. If you and I are connected, if you and I are connected to Christ and into the Trinity, we'll necessarily be connected to each other. And we'll begin to live the right thing. We'll indeed be the right thing. But as long as we try to act as autonomous beings, completely separated from each other, well, we can never truly be a witness of Jesus. We need to be like the boy in the red shirt. We need to be like that. We need to be that. Seeing almost no separation between us and the other. Realizing it's almost like we're all, we're all in this ocean together. And our molecules are all connected. That's who we really are. I can only be fully me if you are with me. And vice versa. So, you know... Thanks to John LaFleur and Sally Watson, Kay and I got invited to the Nimitz Lectures up in, um, up in Fredericksburg this weekend. And I enjoyed them. It was, um, it was, it was uh, really a powerful uh, weekend. But the most powerful thing happened to me in, during one of the breaks. Uh, there are almost no, there are so few World War II survivors today. You know that, right? So when they, when they, when they asked all the War II survivors to raise their hands, there were like two people. Well, I happened to be outside. Kay and I were outside with a, with a guy in a wheelchair, big old boy. And, uh, and uh, he, he never misses. And I said, sir, what theater did you serve in? He said, well, I served in the Pacific. And I said, sir, what was your job? He said, um, well, my job was kind of as a taxi driver. He says, um, I took the Marines to the shore of Iwo Jima. And then I would come and pick up those who were left. I took the boys to the sands of Iwo Jima. 
And I realized two things about that as he spoke. Why would a man go through so much, why would he go through so much effort to, go, to come to Fredericksburg and, and, and be present and, and go through, you know, just going to the bathroom and everything is so difficult when you're that, when you have uh, that many challenges. But I realized Those boys were still with him in the landing craft. And he had never left the black sands of Iwo Jima. And he was as alive as any human being I've ever seen in my life. And that's who we're called to be. We're called to be the man who was a taxi driver in the landing craft to Iwo Jima. Not just dropping off a bunch of Marines in the 1st Marine Division. He's dropping off his own boys, whom he never left. We're meant to be the boy in the bright red H-E-B shirt that runs out and gives a hug to a complete stranger because he can look deep into his soul and knows that he needs it because he knows he's not separated from the 64-year-old man. This was punctuated for me in a powerful way. Lou Kissling and I are, are teaching a class together on Wednesday nights. And everything we're reading and studying in this class is about, about getting rid of the false self. Quit hiding from God. You know, God doesn't hide from us. We hide from God. And we put up these these, these ramparts around, around us that are fueled by the ego and, and we, we, we kind of cower behind there. But that's no way to live. And as, I've been, as we've been studying, every author we've read has said the same thing. You'll never be able to love as long as you're behind that wall. And you'll never really live until you, as long as you hide behind that wall. Do you believe that? It's true. And I think about our life together in this wonderful parish. It is a wonderful parish. We have some challenges. I think of the, some of the challenges that I see before us uh, are with our, with our senior folks. You know, it's great that people are living longer, but it's also tough that people are living longer. And as our people live longer, they get lonelier and lonelier. And if you ask the staff, I'm always on them. How do we stay con con connected to our people who have sat in these pews and said their prayers? And I realize if we, re if, if, if we begin to understand that there's no distance between, between, between our 20-year-old and, 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 and an 85-year-old, there's no real distance. We're connected by Christ himself. Then we'll take care of people better. And what about the growing number of poor folks? that we attend to. I mean, that number's growing significantly. What would happen if we quit talking about the people as if they're a project and as if they're our brothers and sisters? I believe we'll do better work. And people will come alive. People will be healed. And I'm not just talking about the poor folks. I'm talking about you and me. And I think what's most on my mind today is I'm very concerned about our young people destroying themselves. And it's great that, you know, you can say to your child, well, you come from a good family, or I taught you the Ten Commandments when you were younger, but that is not enough. Our young people need to grow up knowing that they're indelibly connected to the Lord, indelibly connected cannot escape his love. There's no place to go away from him. You cannot separate from him. And also, just as important, that they're connected to you and me. Do you get that? So no matter where they go, they know they're connected. It's organic. It's like getting a hug from the boy in the red shirt. Even if you're far away from home, That's the way we're meant to live. So I say to you, as I say to the guy in the mirror, 
let's, let's walk out from behind that castle we've built around ourselves. Let's don the red shirt. Let's get rid of our disability. Let's get rid of it. And live and love freely.